You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another feast day quick take on St. George, a saint of mystery, legend, and glory. First, the legend. The popular story of St. George which has actually been passed down to us since medieval times through the golden legend features fire-breathing dragons, swooning princesses, and our hero, George, saving the day. This is the famed tale, and I venture to guess that if asked, most Catholics can immediately call up the image of a knight in armor fighting a dragon. Fairly enough, too, as the mythical beast has been part of St. George's iconography since the time of the Golden Legend. But this isn't the only amazing tale told of today's saint. In one of his earliest legends, it said St. George was put to death, chopped up into little pieces, buried, and set on fire three times, and each time God restored him to life. Certainly God can do anything, but this legend is especially fog-shrouded with very little attribution. Another possibility, less a legend and more a mystery, is whether St. George was the Roman soldier martyred for ripping down Diocletian's Edict of Persecution from the door of a public building in Nicomedia. We know that some valiant Christian soldier performed this act of daring defiance, but it's not certain who. Maybe St. George. When you read about his life and death, then add in the ancient choice of a dragon for his Christian symbol, you might be convinced. It sounds like something George would do. Though the details of the lives of many early martyrs have been blurred by the mists of time, we have a better idea about the life of St. George than many. Sadly, most people don't know this. It seems many modern biographers prefer the saint himself, and not just the dragon legend, stay hidden away in the myth and legend file. But thanks to several early Greek historians, as well as St. John Damascene, illustrious saint and poet of the 8th century, we do actually have some record of St. George's life and death. Here's what we know. St. George was born to noble Christian parents in Cappadocia, modern-day Turkey. When his father died, he traveled with his mother to Palestine, her native country, and at her death he inherited the considerable estate of her family. A strong, tall man of resolute temperament, a soldier's life appealed to him more than the sedentary life of a nobleman and with the success of his natural ability, he swiftly rose up the ranks to tribune, or colonel, in the Roman army. His fame for courage and fidelity even caught the attention of the emperor, Diocletian himself, who bestowed on George marks of particular favor. Now Diocletian, who had risen from humble beginnings, was a superstitious man who tolerated all religions at the beginning of his reign, and in fact it is said he chose the Christians for his personal bodyguards, trusting due to their Christian beliefs that they would not plot against him. It's also believed, though not documented, that St. George was one of these palace guards, an assignment palatable only because it did not interfere with George's practice of his faith, at first. After Diocletian had ruled for fifteen years or so, emboldened and arrogant in his power, he decided to bring his reign into the line of previous Caesars, proclaiming himself a god, the son of Jupiter, to be exact. No doubt most of his subjects rolled their eyes at this announcement, but were ready to jump through the hoops, as absurd as they might be, to maintain the status quo. The common people knew then, as we know now, how self-absorbed and out-of-touch Caesars generally are. Insanity was the rule of the day, so it didn't come as a surprise when Diocletian demanded allegiance and tribute to himself as a deity, requiring particular fealty from his court and his army. Then, to celebrate his 20th anniversary of Roman rule, he issued the Edict of 303, outlawing all Christianity outright. His persecutions, some of the most harrowing in the early church, persisted until Diocletian's resignation from office in 312 AD. Now, I'm sure the gist of this story sounds familiar. Many heroic saints won their crown under Diocletian because of this ultimatum, the choice between Christ and death. Remember the forty holy martyrs of Sebast? 
Once Diocletian turned against Christianity, George turned against Diocletian, setting the example for the Forty, who would face the same decision 17 years later. Upon being confronted with the demand to wear the insignia of Diocletian, presented as a god, on his uniform, George refused without hesitation, relinquishing his commission and all signs of rank. He was immediately thrown into prison, and like the forty martyrs, was given every opportunity, by reason of bribes alternating with torture, to change his mind about bowing to a newly minted false god. His response to the judge's terms and conditions is recorded in ancient texts. Quote, I despise your promises and do not fear your threats. The emperor's power is of short duration and his reign will soon end. It were better for you, he told the judge, to acknowledge the true God and to seek his kingdom. The judge's response was to have George immediately removed to his prison cell where a great block of stone was placed on his breast. The next day, George was tied to a wheel upon which were fixed sharp knives which, when put into motion, would cut his flesh horribly. His martyrology reports that during this painful trial, he witnessed a heavenly vision, which enjoined him not to fear that God was with him. And it seems that the peace and grace of God not only allowed St. George to persevere and to survive the torture, but inspired many who were present to convert to the faith and to subsequently win the crown of martyrdom themselves. On the next day, April 23, 303, prison guards, men he likely knew, led St. George in chains through the city to a place in the public square where he was beheaded and received his crown of glory. Within 20 years of St. George's martyrdom, Constantine, who had lifted all Christian persecutions under his dominion, built a church in Lida, the city on the coastal plain of Israel, where St. George met with his execution. The church has been destroyed and rebuilt countless times in the 1700 plus years since his death, but the tomb of St. George remains, apparently intact in the crypt beneath, and his skull can be seen in the church of San Giorgio in Velabra in Rome. But St. George's legacy lives on throughout the world, in an almost uncanny way. One of the 14 holy helpers of medieval times, St. George is the patron of England, Greece, Portugal, Russia, Bulgaria, Germany, and the Netherlands, among other smaller principalities. He is also the patron saint of horsemen, cavalry soldiers, soldiers in general, farmers, lepers, shepherds, scouts, and Teutonic knights. The flag of St. George, which bears a red cross on a white background, is the standard of England, as well as the Eastern European country of Georgia. It's also the municipal flag of Montreal, Barcelona, Milan, Genoa, and Padua. It seems no one really knows why England in particular has adopted St. George as a patron, though some essayists suggest that the idea of his valor and knightly integrity are attributes particularly valued by the British. I guess we can accept that. Um, I'd like to think these are attributes that all men of the world would honor and want to emulate. Certainly, when King St. Edward proclaimed St. George's patronage for England in 1350, these masculine traits were highly valued. Alas, though, as you might guess, England has been backing off of St. George of late. In the last few years, there have been so far unsuccessful moves to do away with the flag of St. George, deeming it too, quote, warlike, ostensibly connected to far-right factions, and possibly offensive to Muslims. To make things even more weird, Genoa, Italy has contested since 2018 that the rights to the flag of St. George belong to Genoa, since it proclaimed the saint's patronage in 1190, over 150 years before England did. And now it appears that England has reneged on a long-standing deal with Genoa for its use. Going back to some time in the Reformation era, England signed a document with Genoa attesting to Genoa's first right to the flag and agreeing to pay a sort of rent for its use. And England did actually pay an annual stipend for it until about 250 years ago, when they didn't. As far as I can find out, the two countries have not worked out a back payment deal, 
and only bicker about it occasionally, like when Italian and English fans run into each other at soccer games, maybe. St. George's Day is still a national day of celebration in England, but it hasn't been a national holiday since the 18th century. The Church of England has proclaimed that since the day generally falls between Palm Sunday and Low Sunday, it can't merit a feast day privilege great enough to earn a bank holiday, or some such thing. Basically, since St. Andrew's Day in Scotland and St. Patrick's Day in Ireland are bank holidays and vacation days for many, the English don't see why they can't have a bank holiday too. It's a controversy. Oddly enough, the Church of England is holding sway for a conservative interpretation based on their liturgical reasoning, and perhaps because it knows no one is going to use a bank holiday to go to church and actually celebrate the feast day. And they're probably right. The standard recognition of St. George's Day in England consists of the odd parade, pub bargains on pints, and the flying of the aforementioned flag. Some folks will wear red rose in their lapel, a symbol of St. George's martyrdom, though most don't really know that's the reason for it. Gilbert Chesterton describes the focus in a nutshell. Quote, St. George he was for England, and before he killed the dragon, he drank a pint of English ale out of an English flagon. The fact is, St. George never stepped foot in England. Sorry, Gilbert. He would never even have guessed at its existence as we know it. A man's man and a soldier, though. I'm sure George would have gladly joined Chesterton in a flagon of ale. And though he may or may not have ever faced any of the legendary fire-breathing serpents, I expect St. George would have a lot to say about the real dragons of heresy and the worship of false gods, not just in his time, but rampant and going largely unchecked in our world today. Let's not stop there, though. Many kinds of sins slither about, challenging us to slay them. We can appropriate St. George's dragon to symbolize many sorts of evil. With its scaly hide, it could be seen as sins against the flesh, and the princess saved is purity. The fire and sharp teeth lend themselves well to symbolize gossip, calumny, or backbiting. Or perhaps your own personal dragon is human respect, or, like Smaug in the Hobbit, the attachment to things of this world. We all have our own personal dragons to fight, many as wicked and murderous to the soul as St. George's. Today, on his feast day, we remember how a soldier, and really, take away the fire-breathing dragon and George is an ordinary guy, who understands the daily battle against evil and knows it can be won. He's sympathetic and stands ready to help us. Prayer to St. George Faithful servant of God and invincible martyr St. George, favored by God with a gift of faith and inflamed with an ardent love of Christ, Thou didst fight valiantly against the dragon of pride, falsehood, and deceit. Neither pain nor torture, sword nor death could part thee from the love of Christ. I fervently implore thee, for the sake of this love, to help me by thy intercession to overcome the temptations that surround me, and to bear bravely the trials that oppress me, so that I may patiently carry the cross which is placed upon me, and let neither distress nor difficulties separate me from the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Valiant champion of the faith, assist me in the combat against evil, that I may win the crown promised to them that persevere unto the end. Amen. St. George, Slayer of Dragons, pray for us. You've been listening to the Catholic Family Podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and family. You can support the production on Patreon and PayPal and you can reach Kevin at kevin89davis at gmail.com. At Majorum de Gloriam. All for the greater glory of God.